Sandra Hemingway. I'm the Outreach Manager at the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. And I'm presenting today with Amanda Clement. She's the, um, she's, uh, the Eco AmeriCorps service member who's serving at our district this year. Um, so we'll be co-presenting and I apologize. I'm just making sure that we are recording. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, thank you all for logging in. And we're gonna um, get started shortly. I just wanna tell you a couple things about what we're doing and uh, go over a couple housekeeping tips. Um, so first of all, we are the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. We're a local 19 um, member town district um, in Vermont. And uh, a lot of what we're about to say is, some of it is universal about Recycle It and a lot of it is um, specific to Vermont in our area. Um, we are funded right now for this webinar through the USDA Rural Utility Service. We were luckily enough to receive a grant from them. And so that is um, funding our webinar series this year, among other things. So we want to thank our funders for that as well. Um, Amanda, do you want to say hi before I uh, go through housekeeping tips? Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, yeah, as Cassandra said, I'm the EQ AmeriCorps member for the, uh, for the district this year. Um, hello. <laughs> All right. Hey, Amanda. So um, quick housekeeping. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but um, if you have a question for us, please put it in the Q&A box. There's, you'll notice there's also a chat box. Um, it's helpful for us if you keep your questions in, in the Q&A box. It just keeps us from having to flip around between different spots. The chat box is a great place if you want to communicate with the presenters directly or if you want to communicate with the rest of the folks watching, um, if you have an idea that we didn't mention. But if you have a question directly for us, Q&A box, we're going to be stopping. We have a couple points throughout the webinar. We'll stop and take one or two questions, and then we'll save some time at the end to go through all your questions. Um, so that said, we're going to get started and start talking to you about recycling um, and what goes in, what stays out of your bin and um, what you can recycle beyond just your blue bin. Um, so this is our quick overview. We will be doing a brief introduction to the universal recycling law in Vermont. Um, it won't go into all of the details about it, but we'll give you the basic idea and how that drives what we recycle in the first place around here. Um, Amanda will tell you exactly what goes in your bin and exactly what stays out in great detail. And then I'll talk to you about contamination and what that is and why it's an issue and how um, keeping things out of your bin that don't belong there actually helps every, the whole recycling system. And then we'll go into some details about um, several materials that you can recycle beyond just these six categories that go in your blue bin. There's um, endless, numerous materials that have outlets for recycling, but they're just not in your regular recycling bin. And we'll end with some ideas for reducing your waste in the first place and for reusing and refusing waste. Um, and then we'll um, end with some questions. So Amanda, we'll get us started. All right, so Act 148 um, is a portion of what we're gonna be talking about today um, is what's known as Vermont's Universal Recycling Law. It was passed universally by the Vermont legislature in 2012. And then slowly begin being implemented through phases starting in 2014. So the section that we're gonna be talking about today is recyclables, which were banned from the landfill statewide in 2015. Um, they were banned already um, regionally in some districts. They were banned in our districts earlier than that, but statewide they've been banned since 2015. Other um, materials that are banned from the landfill include food scraps, um, which were banned for large um, producers in 2017, such as hospitals and schools, and then more recently, in July of this year, they were banned for all residents of Vermont. Um, other materials that are banned from the landfill are leaf and yard waste and clean wood. Um, essentially why these are all banned is because they have higher value for reuse and for repurposing and all the organics are banned also because they are big producers of methane if they're put underground. 
I'm just going to pop on so, for a second. I'm sorry, Amanda, mm -hmm. just one quick second yeah. on the Act 148. Um, just to elaborate a little bit on the food scraps, I know that's not the focus of why we're here today, but um, the large generators, most of them, some of them in our area had been keeping food scraps out of the landfill long before Act 148 went into place, but the law actually started requiring food scraps for, you know, like hospitals, universities, those big generators, starting all the way back in 2014. Um, so that part isn't too, isn't really new in Vermont, but the residential food scrap ban is. Anyway, we're, that's a little digression because um, really we're here to talk about recycling. So let's get you to your next slide. Sorry about that. And um, here we go. Sorry, we had a little hopping around. Yeah. All right. So these are the materials that are part of the mandatory recycling in Vermont. Um, it's six different materials. So it's paper, glass, steel, aluminum, cardboard, and rigid plastics. Anything that's not one of those materials is considered contamination, which essentially briefly means that um, it just um, devalues the rest of the recyclables that are, have more value. So it's important to try to keep these out of the lumen as much as possible because Sandra's going to go into a lot more detail about that later. So we're going to go over material by material what goes in your blue bin and what needs to stay out of your blue bin. They're just as important and we're going to start off with paper. So paper seems really easy, um, but it's actually one of the most commonly thrown out recyclable materials that are banned by the law. So uh, paper includes any office paper you may have, glossy paper, junk mail that includes the envelopes, um, including envelopes that have that little like plastic address box, that's fine. You can put that in as it is. Inserts, magazines, um, some exceptions to what can't go into your blue bin for paper or anything that's wet or moldy. That's contamination that just, you know, is nasty and it should stay out. Um, hardcover books aren't recyclable in this way. Um, the paper inside is, the hardcover on the outside is not. So if you need to get rid of a book, of course, first you should try to donate the book. Um, but um, you can slice out the pages in the inside, recycle those in your blue bin, and throw out the hardcover. The biggest exception to paper is any paper that is lined with plastic or wax. When it comes to recyclable uh, recycling, um, in your blue bin, you need to make sure that all materials are made out of one material. So it needs to be just paper, just aluminum, just glass. It can't be, you know, it can't be fused together with another material. So the issue with these is that, you know, at the, um, the MRF or the, um, the uh, material recovery facility is what we call the um, place where all your recyclables go. They can't separate those. So this includes anything that, you know, would have um, anything that like normally contains like liquid or anything wet. Um, commonly animal feed bags are lined with plastic and um, things like milk cartons, um, you know, almond milk or coconut milk cartons. Um, Tetra packs are another one and those are essentially little cartons. Um, a lot of times they have things like coconut water or soups in them. Um, one more exception to the paper rule is if you go over to the picture and you see that, that's a overall a pretty good assessment because it does show that everything should be loose in your bin. But the big exception to that is that shredded paper that you see in there. So shredded paper can be recycled in your blue bin, but you need to make sure that it goes in a clear tied plastic bag. We're gonna talk a lot about how bags need to stay out of your blue bin, but this is one exception to that and make sure that that bag is clear because if it's opaque, the people at the MRF are just gonna throw it away because they don't know what's in there. So cardboard. Cardboard is, really similar to paper, um, cardboard boxes, pizza boxes are totally fine, as long as they're not like covered in cheese and sauce. Grease stains are okay, you can put your pizza boxes in your blue bin. Um, again, nothing wet or moldy and nothing lined with plastic or wax. All right, so moving on. Next material we're gonna talk about is aluminum. Aluminum is a great material to recycle. 
aluminum is pretty much indefinitely recyclable. You could recycle it again and again and again and reuse it again and again and again. It doesn't degrade. If you're going to recycle one material, try to recycle your aluminum. Um, it's also good to recycle because the process of man mining aluminum and making it into a product that can be used is really energy intensive. So the, if we can reuse it as much as possible, it's really good to do. So when you're recycling aluminum, you can recycle most of the aluminum you're going to come across. So you can um, recycle all your cans, pie plates, um, trays, just make sure that they're all clean and dry. Um, you can also recycle aluminum foil, which a lot of times people think you can't recycle. So make sure that all your aluminum foil is, again, clean and dry, um, and then collect all of it. And it doesn't just have to be the, the aluminum foil that, like, is on the roll that you might use for storing things. You can also recycle um, aluminum foil yogurt lids and chocolate wrappers. Just collect all of them and then get them so that you can make a ball that's about the size of a tennis ball, which brings into a rule with recycling, which is that anything that's gonna go into your blue bin needs to be larger than two inches by two inches or smaller than two feet by two feet. If it's out of those size parameters, it's considered contamination because it can cause issues at the MRF. Um, so no aluminum siding, no scrap metal. Um, those need to go to a place that accepts scrap metal, but most aluminum you're gonna um, get container-wise is fine. Steel is pretty similar um, in terms of recycling it. Um, any steel containers like food grade cans, um, cans for pasta sauce. Um, this is a fish can, sardine can that you can recycle. Um, one thing with this is make sure that if you're going to recycle, you, you know, when you recycle your um, sardine cans and things like that, they tend to have like a lot of fish oils on them. Make sure you give them a good scrub out. A lot of times we get asked questions about um, how much you should wash your recyclables. Um, they don't need to be sanitized or anything like that. Most of your recyclables, if you just give them a rinse, shake them off so they're a little bit dry, you can put them in your bin. Um, the only um, ones that you really need to scrub are the ones that might have like stuck on food waste like peanut butter or yogurt, that kind of thing that just is um, can put more contamination in the process. And also it's just kind of gross for the people that work at the MRF. So, and also you can't, re you can't do um, appliances and scrap metal stuff either. That needs to go again to a place that takes scrap metal. So glass, all colors of glass can be recycled in Vermont. Um, glass bottles, um, glass jars, um, all containers. Um, one thing that I wanna point out is you see in this picture that these glass bottles have their lids in it and one of them even has liquid in it. Um, make sure those lids are taken off and make sure that everything is clean and dry before you put it into the recycling bin. Um, and don't put any window glass in, no light bulbs, and don't put any broken glass in your recycling bin. Um, broken glass is just kind of dangerous for people that work at the recycling facility. So if you have broken glass, put it in a paper bag and then put it into your trash. So the last main material that we're gonna be talking about is hard plastics. So these are all clean, rigid plastics that are containers. So a lot of times we used to talk about the numbers that are like on the bottom of your plastic containers with the little arrows. We're not gonna be talking about those just because they're confusing and they don't really tell you what's recyclable in your district or not. Um, so we pretty much tell people, if it's a plastic container that you're gonna come across, it's probably recyclable in your blue bin. So any laundry soap bottles, dish soap bottles, milk jugs, plastic bottles, plastic trays, as long as they're clean and dry, you can put them in your recycling bin. Um, some exceptions um, on the top of that picture there you see. Um, the first one, again, make sure that it's cleaned out. So this peanut butter jar can't go in like that. It needs to be washed out first. Um, plastic bags and films, we're gonna be talking about that in a lot more detail about why those shouldn't go into your blue bin. Um, styrofoam is not recyclable in Vermont in the blue bin. Um, these little lids, um, like I said before, items that go into your blue bin need to be larger than two inches by two inches. So if they're really small, they can't be put in just like that. A good way to make sure that your caps do get recycled is you can leave them right on the bottle. So after you rinse them out, put them back onto the bottle and then you can recycle them like that. And then lastly in this picture is um, hazardous waste that needs to be recycled 
differently at a hazardous waste event or something like that. Um, it can't be recycled in your blue bin. And then the last main one is um, black plastics, and that is the color black plastics. So a lot of times it's like rotisserie chicken containers, comes with a black, a black tray at the bottom, clear tray on the top. The black plastic needs to be put in your trash, um, and the clear plastic can go in your recycling bin. So the bottom line um, when it comes to recycling um, in our district is, is it container or is it paper? If, if it's a container, is it one of made one of, of one of those materials that we talked about, aluminum, steel, glass, or hard plastic? If it's paper, is it all paper? Is it lined with plastic or, or, or wax? It has to be one single material. Make sure that all your recyclables are clean, put them loose in your bin. So make sure you know that what goes in your bin and what doesn't go with your bin. If you have questions about this, you can check with your local solid waste management district. In Vermont, there's about 16 of them across the state. They do things a little bit differently sometimes, but if you're in doubt about whether or not you can put something in your recycling bin, it's best to throw it out and not add contamination. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. Um, that was a really great overview of just the basics, what goes in, what stays out. And um, even that, that can be really complicated. So we do have a couple questions. I think we'll take a couple mm -hmm. right now. Um, okay, so Robin asks, um, and Robin correctly remembers that a few years ago, you weren't supposed to put your, your lids back on bottles. Um, and it's exactly right. And at that time, we, our facility, the ARC, was able to take uh, bottle caps. So, so Robin's question, I think, is, you know, has the rule changed? And the answer is yes. About three or four years ago, um, the MRF, the Materials Recovery Facility, was able to, they, they had some upgrades in their machinery. And some of the changes that came about, one of the changes was they no longer accepted black plastic. Another one was that they can take bottle caps put back onto bottles. So um, that, that was a change in our messaging that happened a few years ago. Not everybody has heard it. So I'm really glad you logged on to just because that makes things a lot simpler. You just rinse out your bottle, shake it out. I usually give it like, you know, just a bunch of shakes and put the lid right back on. That's only for plastic bottles. For glass, you, you don't want to put the lid back on. Um, so a couple other questions. Oh, Amanda, you were going to Sorry, Amanda was going to take the questions. Uh, well, I've got it open now. Amanda, you do the next one. Yeah. Um, staples right. and paper clips are fine with paper. Um, that's one of those things that at the paper mills that that's considered contamination. It will um, it will come out, but you don't need to really go crazy worrying about taking all that off. If you can get the paper clips off, that's great. Staples are less important, um, but either one, if those are mixed in, they'll they'll get sorted out. Um, and finally, Robin also asks about prescription bottles, labels off with caps on. Um, exactly. Um, as long as those prescription bottles are, I'm going to uh, toss this one back over to Amanda because she already introduced our rules to us. So how would you answer that about recycling the prescription bottles, Amanda? So, I mean, first of all, it just depends on the size of the bottle. So if it's one of the really big ones, if it's larger than the two inches by two inches, you can recycle in your bin. If it's one of those really thin ones, it's too small to go into your blue bin. Um, and that includes, um, because the, the two inch by two inch rule doesn't just include like really small item, it also includes thinner items. So. Yeah, exactly. So there are some, there are some prescription pill bottles definitely can go in. Um, and for sure, put the lids back on before you do it. And the reason that I'm pretty sure just for those folks who aren't thinking about prescription bill bottle, pill bottles, the reason you would take the label off is just for your own privacy and safety. Not, not about like you can recycle it with the, lid, with the label on, but um, you probably don't want to do that because it's private information. Um, okay, so keep putting those questions in the Q&A box. We have another break coming up after this section. And, um, and then we'll stop. We'll take a couple more questions. And we'll keep doing that until we get to the I think we have one more cute question break in the middle of the presentation. And then at the end, we'll, we'll answer all of them. So at any point, if you have a question, even if you're going back to some of the stuff Amanda talked about, go ahead and put it in. We'll get to it one way or the other. Um, so Amanda is going to um, 
log off. She'll be keeping an eye on anything you put in that box while I'm talking to you about um, contamination. And uh, Amanda did a great job introducing us to those rules. Um, there's a lot of them. So the basic ones are, are, if you think about what's happening with your recycling, it's a lot easier to remember the rules. And so what's happening for most recycling systems, including ours in the central Vermont area, is that they are getting commingled. It's called single sort recycling. And they're going to a facility called the Materials Recovery Facility, which is, um, we call it the MRF. And as a result of the way it's managed, there are certain things that can be a problem. One of those things is when bags or textiles end up in the recycling bin. Not only is there not a viable way to recycle them through the single sort process, but it's also um, something we'll, we call a tangler and we'll go into more detail about that. Um, clean and dry is really important. And among other things, having your recyclables clean and dry keeps um, odors and food waste and, and that keeps pests, rodent, insects out. It's better at your house. It's better when they're all um, brought together into a facility. Um, and it's also contamination if there's food soiled, um, you know, food products on your bins, then it's actual contamination. Um, the two inch rule is another, that's a rule that's really like, remember that because your recyclables get sorted at a factory, at a facility where there's machines, conveyor belts, blowers, magnets, all kinds of things and human beings. And so as the kind of machinery kind of drives what we can take and not take. And one of those things is anything smaller than that two inches by two inches or larger than two feet by two feet. It's the two by two rule. And it really just has to do with how the recyclables are sorted. Um, and another thing that a lot of people don't realize that's really important is uh, you should not be bagging your recyclables. When you're putting them out in your cart or bringing them to a transfer station, they don't get bagged. They should be loose in your bin always. Um, those bags are contamination and they're really problematic and it's not necessary. Um, and as Amanda said earlier, if in doubt, throw it out. It's better for the whole system to not recycle it if you're not sure. And I know that goes against what a lot of us would like, uh, It's but it, it, and myself particularly, but it really does, if we wanna make sure everything gets recycled, if you're not sure and you can't get the answer, um, keep it out of your recycling bin. And that leads to um, one of the common questions that comes up regularly, um, years and years of doing this work and this question continues to surface. It's hard for, some people really don't know if their materials are actually getting recycled. And there's been a lot of press, uh, you know, coming out of um, China having closed down its markets. Um, they didn't close them down, but they tightened up their contamination rules to the point where it really uh, did close it to the U.S. Um, and so, you know, some of the press has been inaccurate. Some of it has been accurate for some areas of the country, but not for others. And so if you, if you hear an article on a national news publication or, uh, I mean, a, a news story that tells you that recycling all goes to the landfill, check with your local solid waste district or local Department of Environmental Conservation before you believe it, because um, a lot of that press is really um, not necessarily actually how things are specifically in our area. Um, so the short answer to does it really get recycled is in Vermont right now, yes. Um, and the, one of the reasons is because when the foreign markets where a lot of the US recyclables end up, when those um, crack down on their contamination guidelines, Vermont was already marketing materials to domestic markets. So when, you, when, you're, when your recycling goes to the MRF, um, there's this whole process. If you get a chance when COVID is <laughs> post COVID someday in the future, I recommend you go tour the MRF and see how your recyclables get sorted. It's so interesting. Um, but ultimately that all of this commingled material really does get sorted out and um, it gets bailed into bales that then get shipped to markets where the materials are, you know, basically they're raw materials and they go back into manufacturing. Um, so that's all happening domestically. We were already doing that. So when like the China market closed down, that did affect us in that recycling prices, re prices for us to send our recycling away um, or prices that people paid for our materials changed and it ends up costing more to recycle now. 
which explains why some of you may have noticed that all of a sudden there were fees for recycling that didn't used to be there. That's all because the recycling system, you know, we got caught in this uh, global issue that affected us. But the bottom line is your materials are getting recycled and Vermont has been very active in keeping um, up with as, as much as we can develop recycling markets locally, like regionally, you know, Vermont is at least paying attention to that. I don't know of any, there are even some um, happening in Vermont that, you know, they're not up and running yet. So it's not worth talking about, but there's a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship around creating new domestic recycling markets, but it takes some years to get those going. So I think we'll be seeing more of that in the near future. Um, but let's talk about contamination. You know, we know what happened with China was, I can't remember what their original contamination rate what they were accepting was, but it was enormous. And they, they reduced that to their maximum amount of contamination they accept was a half percent, one half of 1%. Mm -hmm. So um, that sounds tiny, but actually I'll explain more about this picture, but this picture is a picture of contamination and from cardboard and paper that's recycled at a paper mill here in Vermont. And um, one half of 1% when you have millions of tons of material is a lot and it costs a lot to, to throw away and it costs a lot to get it out of the stream. Um, so the first thing we wanna do to make sure that we have a market for our recyclables and that we can get the best price for them so we can keep the recycling system going is reduce or eliminate contamination. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what Amanda and I are doing today by educating, you know, getting yourself educated and helping your friends and family understand it as well. Um, contamination matters. And I, I saw this um, really clearly when I was part of a group of solid waste management um, folks who toured the West Rock paper mill in Sheldon, Vermont. And we, um, we saw how they have to um, manage contamination and they talked about what their cost for landfilling it. Um, before I go into that though, I just wanna also mention the other factor in your materials getting recycled are markets. Markets change. Um, not long ago, cardboard was a great, there was a great market for cardboard. And um, even when other recycling markets started to tank, cardboard was still a moneymaker. Now cardboard isn't worth out much, but they go up and they go down. I, I fully expect them to go back up. Um, but that also explains why you've probably heard about glass being an issue in Vermont. Um, glass is a very difficult material to recycle that didn't always used to be the case. Um, there's a number of reasons why. One of the main reasons why we have difficulty actually recycling glass is because our systems are all now built to be single sort. Everything goes into the same bin, which means every color of glass is commingling. Brown, green, white, uh, blue, all the different colors of glass are all mixed together. So there's no value to them. If there were some sort of remaining outposts, of, of places around Vermont that still require sorting. If you are in one of those areas, you should be thankful. It's a little bit more time on your end, but they can actually market that glass to get recycled if it's, you know, and, and one of the, to speak to that point, our bottle bill in Vermont, we're very lucky we live in a state with a bottle bill. Um, I don't wanna say a number because I'm, I, I haven't looked at the most recent number. My understanding though is close to 80% of all glass in the bottle bill, the glass bottles that are recycled in the bottle bill are actually recycled, returned and recycled compared to the glass you put in your bin, which um, is very rarely recycled back into a glass bottle or you know, it's usually downgraded. So it, it might get recycled. Um, the markets around here, there's two M, the number two and the letter M in Canada and they make fiberglass insulation. So some of the glass in the state goes to 2M and gets turned into fiberglass insulation. And there's a big market for what they call glass aggregate. So a lot of glass, most of the glass actually goes for aggregate. And that is basically where the sand is, um, the glass is crushed in a way that uh, makes it resemble sand, but it's not, it's glass. And it's used in construction and building and for like laying pipes and um, it's actually really, really valuable. It drains a lot better than sand or gravel. Um, it has a high, it's, it's, it's uh, been used for road beds 
and it has a lot of uses. But again, this is um, this is more reuse than recycling. So it's it's good to be aware of that. But be, if you know that and your interest is in reducing waste, one of the options is to reuse as many glass bottles as you can rather than recycling them. Um, so quickly, I'm just going to briefly uh, go back to the West Rock paper mill. And so what we saw was we actually watched all the bales of mixed paper and cardboard go into a big slurry of hot water in a, it was almost like a mixing bowl until it becomes a slush. If anybody's ever made paper at home, it was basically that. Um, but then they actually have a machine that sucks out, like think of cardboard, there's usually tape on it. So any little plastic pieces, any like, you know, anything that ended up with the paper that doesn't belong, it gets sucked out of there and it goes through a bunch of machines and then it gets spit out the other end and it looks like this. It looks kind of like the paper slurry, but actually these are all little tiny pieces of contamination that would ruin their product if it, if it continued through the system. And they end up with tons of this that they have to pay the landfill. So it's even in this where the only material they're recycling is cardboard and they have a fairly low contamination rate, it still really matters. Um, so what is contamination? What am I talking about? Amanda really had a great intro about that. You know, she talked about anything that doesn't go in the bin is contamination. And now that you have that list of what goes in the bin, it's really true. If it's not on the list, it's contamination. You don't see clothing on the list. Don't put clothing in your bin. You don't see plastic bags on the list. Don't put plastic bags. You know, that it's pretty straightforward. But um, because uh, those of us who are really dedicated to it and really care about it, um, want to recycle as much as possible. Sometimes it's really people like us who are really well-meaning that end up causing contamination more than anyone. So um, we have to really check ourselves and bite the bullet and um, find another thing to do, either trash or give away or reuse for the materials that don't go in the bin. Um, so, when we say anything that can clog machinery at the MRF, um, one of those things is those uh, anything that's smaller than two inches by two inches. It falls between the cracks. It ends up in these kinds of you know machinery, and it can literally stop things from working. Um, the, but the biggest problem is really these plastic bags. And this here, what you're looking at here, is a factory that had to stop production, shut off the the machine. And these workers have to go in and cut out, just physically cut out all of this contamination. And the kinds of things that get tangled in here are hoses, uh, textiles, and plastic bags primarily. Um, so first of all, this is a huge money suck for the factory because you know they're shutting down production. Sometimes it takes an hour or more. Um, but the other thing is it's dangerous. I don't think any of us would wanna be those two guys in that situation. Um, so we can prevent that by keeping those materials out of our bins. Um, and this is just a list of the common contaminants. Of course, you know, we've heard horror stories of um, diapers and animals and all kinds of strange things ending up in recycling bins. But these are the common things. Um, and of course, the list goes on. So of course, there's the tanglers. We just talked about that. Um, and the items smaller than two inches by two inches. Also, those items larger than two feet by two feet, but uh, those those are called bulky plastics. And um, the single sort recycling bin is not the outlet for those. Um, but really, like the small and tiny items are really important to stay out. Things like disposable coffee cups can be tricky because they look like paper, but they actually have that plastic liner. And so those are contamination if they go in your bin. And Amanda spoke really well to that right at the beginning of the presentation where she talked about, um, you know, when, if, you're, if your material has like paper, if it has another material in it like plastic, you know, as soon as it's two materials, often that's something that holds a liquid like a disposable coffee cup. So if you have something that looks like paper but it's been holding a liquid, it's probably not supposed to go in your bin. Um, tissues, napkins, and paper towels, yes, they're paper, but they, at, at that point, those, um, there's just not an, enough, the, the fibers are too short there's not enough integrity for those to go back into recycling. Also, usually those are items that we have put on our face and so they're contaminated. You can recycle them. You can recycle all of those things as long as you have uh, only paper. So that would mean like no tissues with lotion on them, no paper towels that have a stretch that's plastic, just plain 100% paper. Um, and then 
Uh, Amanda also talked about black plastic. I'm gonna talk about that again. Um, black plastic, we don't recycle in Vermont. If you're outside of the state, it very likely can be. But in our state, we're a very small population. And if you took everything everyone in Vermont recycled and put it in one place, the black plastic would be a minute percentage of that. Like it's less than 1%, but the color of it, um, it, it leaches into all the other colors of plastic. So all the plastics combined, um, they, there isn't really a way to capture them and recycle them because they're all gonna be kind of gray. Um, and we don't have enough volume in our state to separate out black plastics as a separate marketable material. So unfortunately, we have to throw those out. Um, and this is another image here of the, the other things that are really important to keep out. Batteries are hugely dangerous if they end up in your recycling bin. And in a minute, I'm gonna talk about that. Um, the electronics as well. These are items, batteries and electronics that are actually very dangerous if they end up in your bin. You might think it's not dangerous if it's a cell phone or some other electronic device. Vapes are highly dangerous. They have little tiny lithium ion batteries and they can start very big, very hot fires if they get crushed or damaged. Um, so anything that uh, particularly that has a battery is absolutely does not belong in your bin. And we will talk about where that does go. Um, and of course, scrap metal is a different category too. And there's metal recyclers all around Vermont. In our area, there's Bulldogs recycling in Middlesex, there's Gates salvage in all metals in Hardwick. So there's plenty of places to take your metal, um, but um, scrap metal doesn't go in your bin. So um, just as a review, contamination can jam the machinery and all that does is make it more expensive and more difficult to actually recycle. Um, it's dangerous for the people who work in the facilities um, and the forcing the facility shutdowns is, is the reason why it can be expensive. Um, and it, it could also end up, you know, even if it makes it through the machine, you know, if there's too much contamination, the materials are really hard to market at best. Um, the, there's, they don't get as much um, dollar value. At worst, they actually have to get landfilled. Um, and these, these are headlines from some actual issues and shutdowns that happen from contamination at recycling facilities. These first two are, are here in Vermont. Um, one was a shutdown because of a chemical release. Um, and when it's an unknown, I think it ended up being a mace or something like that. But when it goes off and it's an unknown, they just have to shut the whole thing down until they can figure out what's going on. And this fire, um, I don't remember what started this fire, but it was another thing. They call it wish recycling. When people put things they wish were recyclable in the bin, it actually, you know, this is often the result. This, uh, this headline here, the fire in Tioga County, this one is really scary. This was a, somebody had put a cell phone into the recycling bin and cell phones have lithium ion batteries and it must have gotten crushed or damaged, started a fire, the fire, burned for three days and it absolutely leveled that recycling facility. So uh, how many millions of dollars did it cost to rebuild that facility? I haven't followed the story to know, but it's in the many millions of dollars to rebuild a recycling facility. And they're just lucky that nobody got hurt or killed in that. Um, I read about when I was studying this lithium ion battery issue, I read about a landfill fire that went on for years because of the, the um, packed anaerobic conditions in the landfill, which is very scary when you think of methane release and fire and also from a lithium ion battery. Um, so actually very shortly, Amanda is gonna to talk to you about what to do with electronics and batteries because there are safe outlets for those. They don't go in the trash and they don't go in the recycling. Um, but this is just examples of how really serious it can be when there's contamination. Um, Okay, so that was, that was our overview of contamination. I saw a few questions come in. Um, Amanda, can you, can you read out the questions? Ooh, we're having a little bit of a issue with your, um, with your sound, your audio. It sounded a little robotic for a second there. Oof, I don't know. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to suggest Amanda that you call in on your phone so we can get you can stay on video. And in the meantime, while you're doing that, I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and check the questions. Um, so we have a question if we have more recyclables than will fit in the blue bin. Can we use a bag, a recyclable paper bag to hold the extras. Um, well, you can you can use a recyclable paper bag to hold the extras, but um, ideally everything should be loose or you should find a different bin. Um, because uh, if that bag gets rolled up and thrown in the recycling, as far as the folks at the MRF are concerned, it's actually um, an opaque bag and, um, and the opaque bags are something that they will throw out because they don't know what's inside it. Um, so, Clear. So this Theron, who's actually our coworker, <laughs> Theron is asking about clear plastic disposable cups. Um, so when you say no disposable coffee cups, you mean styrofoam cups. Styrofoam cups, yes, but we're actually we're also talking about the paper cups with the plastic liner. Clear plastic disposable cups are typically uh, for cold drinks, and those are fine. And um, even the opaque plastic. If it's a plastic cup, that's fine as long as it's rinsed out. Usually the, any of the uh, cups that are designed for hot drinks have some kind of a liner um, and they're multi-materials and those are not recyclable. Um, okay, we're going to move on. Um, I just wanna make sure Amanda has, Amanda's gonna call in. So I'll check the um, participants. Um, sorry, we're having a technical glitch. Um, hmm. Nope, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing Amanda. Okay, I'm gonna answer one more question while we wait to, to see if we can figure out Amanda's, um, Amanda's audio. I'm really sorry. We do occasionally, we all work from home still with COVID and we do occasionally have t technical glitches. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, I see. We're having a, a weird thing where, um, for some reason, some people logged in and you're showing up under our, my coworker's name. But thank you for clarifying that. We tried something new this time around with Eventbrite, and I think this might be one of the results. Um, so, one question from Betsy Allen is, "Where do we get the blue bins?" Um, that's a really good question. That depends. I know in Chittenden County they used to give them out, and now they sell them. We have some that we're giving, but they're they're specifically for people who live in affordable housing units. Um, we're multi-unit housing, so if that's your situation, you should contact me directly. You'll have my email um, at the end of the webinar. We send a copy out to everybody, and we have um, some links to some of the things we've been talking about. So, um, you know, when you get that email, contact me directly. Um, if you don't have a blue bin, though, that's okay. You can use a cardboard box. Um, some people will have their recyclables picked up on their curbside and usually the hauling company will give you a rolling cart to use. Um, and some people will um, bring their recyclables to a facility. And if that's the case, you can put your recyclables in anything as long as you drop it loose, like at a transfer station. So in that case, you could use a, a paper bag and just shake it out into the um, into the, at the transfer station recycling spot and you can throw the paper bag in when you're done. Um, okay, I'm sorry about the technical glitch. I'm just checking to see if it looks like we have someone in the chat box. Um, okay, so we're gonna just get Amanda set up. Um, I think, uh, I think that's Amanda. Amanda, can you talk now? Um, if you can unmute, I think your phone should work. Hmm. Here, I think we have sound. Okay. All right, perfect. Um, thank you all for your patience as we work through that technical glitch. Yeah, Amanda's, <laughs> Amanda's doing the next section, so I wanted to make sure she had audio. Okay, I'm going to log off, and Amanda, you go ahead and talk about what kinds of additional recycling people can do. All right, so sorry about this. 
um, <laughs> little clunky. Um, so um, even though we were talking about the things that you can't put in your blue bin, there are lots of other ways that you can recycle things that is not necessarily in your blue bin. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of those. Um, it's just a few of them, but it's some of the most commonly done ones. So first of all, plastic bags. So we talked a lot about how plastic bags are contamination, and if you put them in your blue bin, they can cause a lot of problems with the MRF. But that does not mean that you should just put them in the trash and they end up in the landfill. Um, plastic bags are plastic. Um, they contain a lot of chemicals. And if you put them in the landfill, there's a chance that those chemicals can leach out into groundwater and issues like that. So um, it's best to find a place that you can recycle them. So if you're wondering whether or not it's a plastic bag or plastic film is what they're also called. Um, if you take it and it's kind of, kind of see-through and it stretches a little bit, it's probably a plastic bag or film. Um, it's typically, you know, they're all over the place. Even though plastic bags are now banned in Vermont, you're gonna see a lot of plastic film still. So, um, you know, on top of water, um, plastic bags, paper towels, all those things. Um, and the best place to find one is there's the website at the bottom, um, plasticfilmrecycling.org. Um, is a good resource for that. Um, a lot of times in this area, it's a grocery store, like a big grocery store, like a Hannaford's or a Shaw's or something like that. And you can bring all of your films and drop them off there. They'll have a bin. Um, if they tell you that they aren't um, accepting them, don't get angry. Um, one of the things is that is that um, grocery store employees are not taught how to recycle. They're taught how to be grocery store employees. So. They might not necessarily know, just save them for later and then bring them back at another time. So we're gonna move on. All right, special recycling. So we talked a little, Sandra talked a little bit about this um, briefly. Um, so in Vermont, um, we have what's called special recycling through extended producer responsibility or EPR. Um, and essentially it's a legislation that says that producers of certain projects and products have to see those products through the end of their life cycle. So these products include paint, fluorescent bulbs, batteries, electronics, um, all mercury containing, lots of mercury containing devices such as thermostats and other, you know, as fluorescent bulbs also contain mercury. And these are items that if they are put in the landfill, they're really toxic. Um, so it's best that they stay out of the landfill and they can also be really dangerous like batteries. So there's this, the website at the bottom of the page there. It's a Department of Environmental Conservation website. That's a good resource. But also there is a site for every one of these products that will tell you where you can go and drop them off. And we'll give you more detail about that. So each one of these pro products, um, you can go to these websites, you can plug in your zip code and um, it'll tell you where you can go to drop it off. Typically it's like a point of purchase, like where you would have purchased the paint can or something like that. Um, and it'll give you details about that. And you're gonna get all of these websites when we send you a copy of the webinar later on. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, that, um, that I'm just going to go back one slide because, um, you know, this, this is a lot to remember one, two, three, four, five recycling websites. Um, but like Amanda really did was right to point out this particular, the dec.vermont.gov. Um, we, that's what we link to. You're, you're all going to get an email and have a copy of the recording of this webinar, but it will have some of these resources and there's going to be a link to this website. On the DEC website, they have all of this right there. And um, pretty much you're going to, um, once you look at the list, you're going to, it's all going to make sense. You're not going to have to look at it twice. Um, it's just check it. And, and the reason the next, um, the next slide here is about our facility. So we run the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District's facility. We call it the ARC. That's the Additional Recyclables Collection Center. And we take all of those materials at the ARC. It's located in Barrie at 540 North Main Street. Um, we take, so we take all the state EPR materials and there's no fee for dropping those off. 
However, we do have fees. We also take uh, upwards of 40 other hard to recycle items. And there are fees for dropping those off. So if you're just coming with EPR materials, fine, no fee. If you have anything else, you know, there are some fees. We try to keep them nominal, but we have to cover the cost of the program too. Um, because what we do is additional recycling. So this is not the blue bin stuff that Amanda went into depth about. This is not the state mandated recycling. This is the take it to the next level and do extra. Um, so if you're, and because of that, we're kind of feeling out and trying to grow markets. Um, so sometimes those markets disappear, sometimes they come back. Sometimes um, we learn by providing an outlet for certain materials like bottle caps that we no longer take, that those actually cost more than um, makes sense financially for our program. So, you know, that's why our list changes. Sometimes it changes a couple times a year or more. So we recommend even it for people who have been frequent regular visitors to the ARC, every time you go check the website cvswmd.org backslash ARC, A-R-C-C, every single time. Because um, in, in addition to um, changes in what we actually accept or discontinued items, we also have been had an evolving response um, to COVID and our COVID safety precautions have been evolving since March, just like all other businesses. Um, but we've had to really make some changes to how we operate in order to keep everybody safe. So um, we have that also detailed on our website. Um, one thing that happens is because we can take so many items, it's just this massive array of stuff. Um, people kind of conflate that and think, oh, they take everything at the ARC. We don't take everything. And actually just like contamination in your recycling bin, if you bring us everything, we end up with a big bill for landfilling it plus the cost of the staff time for going through it. So we really ask if you're going to use the ARC, please check our list, check it twice, <laughs> make sure whatever you bring, it's only what we have on the list and nothing else. We really can't take it if it's not on the list. Um, and we have a few rules, um, just like recycling. And again, this is based on how we, how our facility works. So our facility, we are separating everything. Uh, unlike uh, blue bin recycling, where everything's commingled, we actually separate every single thing. And the reason for that is because each one of the items we take are have different markets. And just for a, an example, we can take strange things like wine bottle corks, and we actually can take like empty toothpaste tubes and um, or de the toothbrushes that are, you're no longer using. Like we call that the oral care products, Pe pellet bags, shoes, clothing textiles, books, um, you know, small metal pieces, cell phones, um, wires, we can take Christmas lights, we can take pens that have died, markers, um, spray trigger, you know, packaging for, um, there's just, it's an endless array. It's not endless, <laughs> but it's a lot. And it's a lot of weird little things that normally don't go in your bin. So we do need you to pre-sort them. Um, so you can't hand us a box that's everything's mixed together. We might have to send you away if you do that. But if you come in and you have it, you know, however it works for you, for me, I have a lot of those bags. Um, it's a new kind of packaging material. I'm not really fond of it, but a lot of things are now coming in like um, sugars or a lot of the things I buy, um, even my dog treats, instead of coming in a plastic, uh, a cardboard box or a plastic bottle, they're coming in like a thick plastic bag with a with a uh, zip re reclosable Ziploc thing at the top. So I actually use those and I have a different one of those bags for each one of the little things, uh, however you want to do it, um, but pre-sort it and prepare. There's a couple materials that do require preparation. Um, for the pellet bags, that's a really big item. We get pretty much this time of year and through the end of March. Um, those need to be cut open on all sides. So you end up with one flat sheet of plastic, shake it off, and basically you're getting all the dust off of there. Um, it may not seem like a lot to you, but when we get, you know, like uh, hundreds of those in a day, uh, our recycling facility will turn them away if they have dust in them because it ends up being a huge amount of dust and it contaminates the whole load. So we just require everyone to cut it open, shake it off, and, um, and then you can bring it to us. And the same thing with batteries, 
there is there are safety rules around how to ship batteries. Um, we don't you don't need to worry if they're just like alkaline batteries, AAA, AA, those D cell alkaline batteries. You can just bring. Uh, you don't have to do anything special, but any other kind of battery either needs to be individually in a small plastic bag or use packing tape to tape the terminal ends of the battery because those can batteries can be really dangerous in shipment. Um, so, and just to reiterate, because I, I know as an adult learner myself, if I don't hear things repeated over and over and over again, I forget them. So just so you don't forget, come visit our website before you come to the ARC and it's cvswmd.org backslash ARCC. And you'll get a link to our um, ARC brochure in that follow-up email that's coming. Um, okay, I see questions coming in. We're gonna, we're gonna, we have one more section and then we're gonna just do Q&A session for until we're done. Um, but Amanda and I really wanna talk to you about, um, about how to reduce your waste in the first place because you know recycling is a really good system for keeping things out of the landfill and for saving on the environmental um, detrimental effects for mining and virgin mining and for manufacturing fresh materials but it still requires a lot of energy and um, a lot of time and a lot of carbon footprint. Um, so it's, it's good to do, it's better than landfilling, but even better yet is to, to not produce it in the first place, which I say that understanding that that's part of the world we live in right now. So, um, you know, we all understand that, but um, I'm sure that if you're logged into this webinar, you already care about recycling and you're probably doing a lot of these things already, but we're just gonna go through the list in case there's something you haven't thought of yet. Um, so this is a little bit of a cheesy term, but we like, we'd like we like to recommend pre-cycling. That basically means avoiding recycling by um, reducing what you use in the first place. A lot of that has to do with planning ahead and planning ahead doesn't always happen, but when it does, it can avoid, if you plan ahead by you have a travel mug with you or a, wa a reusable water bottle, um, it can allow you to just use less, buy less. Um, you know, some of these suggestions were possible pre-COVID and aren't now, such as bringing your own takeout containers. A lot of places aren't allowing that anymore, but um, when that was possible, and, and I hope again will one day be possible, bringing your own takeout containers when you order out is one way to reduce waste. Um, of course, thrifting, you know, anytime you can buy something secondhand, um, a few things happen. One thing is um, when you're, you can even buy some really high quality secondhand items online these days. Um, Poshmark, ThreadUp, those kinds of websites have some real nice stuff. Um, I find that I can often afford brands that I, I just wouldn't even be able to afford new. Um, so I'm, you can get a higher quality item for less money. And also you eliminate the whole issue of packaging when you're buying secondhand. Um, so it's a, it's a really like, actually has a pretty big impact when you think about how you use your dollars that way. Um, this whole section here about shopping bags, produce bags, using reusables, um, that's a little bit of, um, you know, that was, we put that in there before the plastic bag ban went into effect this July, but it's still something to remember. Um, it's, it's certainly, you know, making and using paper bags um, uses energy and has a carbon footprint just the way plastic does. Um, it's not as detrimental when they get landfilled, if, especially if you recycle them, but it's still an issue. So bringing your own bags can make a big difference, it saves you money, and it, it's better for the environment. And then the last thing on the list is refuse. You don't have to, you don't have to have a straw in your drink. You don't, well, you might, there might be a medical reason, but if you don't need something, you, you can refuse it. You can choose to have a cloth napkin with you or um, or not buy something with unnecessary packaging. And so Amanda's gonna talk a little bit more about that and then we're gonna take some questions. Um, let's see, can you put your video on? Good, okay, I'm gonna pop off now. All right, so like Cassandra was saying, um, part of um, reducing your waste is not buying things to begin with. So this is an image that we pulled off of um, Instagram and it's called um, the biarchy of needs. So essentially it's showing you things that you can do before you buy something that is like made out of like new virgin materials, it's gonna create waste. So the first thing you can do is obviously use what you have. 
So I um, I was lucky enough to um, like meet my great grandparents and my grandmother, and they always use the term, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, so, you know, um, keep around what you have as long as you possibly can. Um, if it keeps working for you, keep using it. You don't have to go out and get something new. Um, and then also, you know, if you do those things, you know, become a little bit broken, um, you don't, you can, and you can repair them, try to do that. You know, if it, if it is broke, fix it. Um, so that's a good thing to go for. And also, this is also important when, um, is what people tend to start going towards zero waste. They often think that they need to go out and they need to buy things. They need to go out and they need to buy designated, you know, bamboo cutlery sets and mason jars and all that stuff and that's not really zero waste i mean you if you think about it you probably already have um silverware in your house you could you know put together a spoon a fork and a knife wrap it in a cloth and a napkin and then you have yourself a little um set of um utensils that you can bring out with you um and um if you need storage jars you know, save jam jars. You know, we were talking about how glass isn't doesn't isn't recycled in the best way right now. Um, you know, try to avoid sending it to, you know, re the recycling center and the landfill as much as possible before you even, you know, it even leaves your house. So the next one is borrowing. So this is especially important. Like if you um, are looking for a specific tool or something like that, you're only going to use it a few times. Um, don't go out and buy it. Um, you know, ask your friends and your family. Maybe they have one. They'll let you borrow it for your project, and then you can return it to them. Um, this is also good to bring up that, you know, if people, a lot of people have things that they don't need and they're not using in their basement and things like that. So, you know, if you're looking for something new, ask around. Maybe someone will have something. Um, along the same lines of swapping. So one thing that I um, have heard of is, like, clothing swaps. So it's not as, um, you know, with with the um, pandemic, it's a little bit tricky now, but um, you can get your friends together um, post-COVID and you bring all your clothes that you were going to bring to donate anyways, and you can swap them. And it's like you're getting new clothes for essentially free without having to go out and buy anything. Um, and along the same lines as thrifting, except for you are buying the things. So um buy things secondhand when you can so go out and there's lots of thrift shops for clothes and i always like those because you can normally get something that's much higher quality um than you normally would be able to afford for a much more reasonable price and i mean older clothes also tend to have been made that were made better um you know before fast fashion was as common as it is now um, but you don't only, only have to thrift clothes either. It's important to remember that, you know, um, places like, I don't know, um, Facebook marketplace and that kind of thing, people will sell like their slightly used televisions or something like that. Try to get one, you know, that you, that's already been produced before you go out and buy one that's just, you know, new. And then that last two are making things and buying things. So if you're really good at making things, try to make things first. Um, Normally materials that are like fabrics and wood and lumber and that kind of thing before they're made into products have a lower energy use um, before that anyways. And it's also good to have hobbies and things like that. Those skills are important. And then lastly is buying things. So when you're buying things, it's really important to remember that you as a consumer have power. So don't um, support companies that are doing things that you don't agree with. Um, support companies that are um, doing things in ways that um, you accept sustainably, um, which kind of goes along with re refusing, which is the next slide. So these are some of the images um, that we pulled off another Instagram um, profile that's called Pointless Packaging. Um, and it's all these examples of pointless packaging. So um, a lot of produce, like um, this potato that's covered in cling wrap and this eggplant, it's got a plastic bag around it. Um, when you're buying things like this um, in your grocery store, um, try to buy them without packaging, if at all possible. Don't support the companies that are putting them 
these um, produce in unnecessary plastic bags. Um, try to support companies that use as little packaging as possible um, if you're worried about waste. Um, and I mean, of course, some items, it's, it's pretty difficult to get rid of the waste altogether. Like, um, I recently bought myself some deodorant that came in just a cardboard tube, almost like a push-up pop kind of tube. And that's great because, as you said before, paper is really recyclable. And even if it's covered in material, you, you might be able to compost that um, wrapper or use it in a different way. Um, and there's lots of companies that are doing things more sustainably. And even if there isn't one that are doing things package free, um, there are other companies that are supporting good causes and um, you should do a little bit of research before you go and buy things and also buy things that are as high quality as you can afford to um, buy things that are going to last. And then this last slide has a lot of pictures of um, has some pictures of the things that we sell um, in the district. Um, that are zero line swap ideas. Um, but as we said before, um, you don't need to buy these if you already have things. So this utensil set um, is great if you're going, to, if you are um, really using your utensil set all the time and you decide that you want to upgrade or something like that, you're going to use it all the time, but you probably already have silverware in your house um, that you could put in your bag. Um, the same with things like shopping bags. Um, most people I know have a pole drawer sh reusable shopping bags that they already have. Um, so as we, as I just said, and as Sandra mentioned before, try to use what you have before you go out and buy things. The best way to avoid waste is to not um, buy the waste in the first place. That's a great place to end, Amanda. The best way to avoid waste is to not make it in the first place. Um, but we also are pretty aware that it's hard to live in the world we are in um, without encountering packaging and, and materials that need to be recycled or, or thrown in the landfill. So at, on that note, um, Amanda, can you um, pull some of those questions off the Q&A and let's start, let's see what we've got. Yeah, we've got a few questions. So I'm not sure which one of these you answered when I was having my little phone mishap, but um, <laughs> um, <laughs> here, I'll, I can I can get rid of those. Okay, I think the there's three okay. left we haven't answered. All right, so the first one's from Betsy. Um, it says, "Where do we get the blue bins?" Oh, we did talk about that. Okay, so two places. Okay. I would I I want to add to one thing to that. Sometimes if you are if you have a hauler. Like, I'm not sure how your trash is handled, Betsy. If you have somebody who's doing curbside hauling, I would ask them if they have blue bins that you can have. Um, otherwise, um, you know, if you're taking your trash yourself to a transfer station or to a, a fast trash uh, spot on Saturday or Wednesday, you can take it in anything. You don't need a, a specific blue bin, um, but you know, you should stay in touch if you're still looking for something to hold your recyclables. All right, so the next one is, can you recycle cartridges used for camp cook stove? So I'm assuming that's like the little propane tanks. Um, that's what I would guess. That was, that's what I'm thinking too. I think if that, if it's not the propane tanks, um, then Betsy, please chime in. But if it is, um, then we can take those at the ARC um, and those can be recycled, but not in your blue bin. That is the kind of thing that would actually be dangerous in a blue bin, especially if there's any gas left in it. Um, but we take those at the ARC and we have a special propane canister cage that it goes in. Um, the other thing is you might wanna ask at some of the stores where they take, they sell like those five gallon containers of, um, of gasoline, of, of propane and ask them if they would take the, take the canister back also. Um, All right, so the next question we have is from Robin. So as um, I was wondering how to dispose of my inhalers. I have a bag of them. I use two kinds. One is used monthly. Um, I had technical difficulties and had to start my, I missed some of your presentation. Um, we will be sending you the presentation so you can watch it later, but inhalers. Um, so that's tricky. I would definitely not in the blue bin. 
I would say the best way to manage an inhaler would be um, to recycle it with prescription drugs. Um, but I would want to double check on that because I'm not 100% sure. In Vermont, the Vermont Department of Health actually has some really great options for, um, for dropping off prescription drugs. There's two goals behind that. One is to keep prescription drugs out of the landfill where they will contribute to landfill leachate. And the leachate, fun fact, gets uh, processed right here in Montpelier at, at our wastewater plant. And then that water that's processed goes back into the groundwater and ultimately comes back as drinking water. I mean, it's a long process between getting treated and coming back. But the fact is that there are ph pharmaceuticals that trace amounts that end up in water. So, um, you know, that's the long way of saying there's, there's some real goals that the state has for keeping those items out of the landfill. The Vermont Department of Health has a great take back program there's two drug take back days a year, one in April, one in October. You just missed the October one. But most of the police station and sheriff's departments around here can take them anytime. There's no time restrictions. Um, there's also drop boxes. Like so at the hot Central Vermont Medical Center, for example, has a, a prescription drop off box. And then finally, if you go to the Vermont Department of Health website, and you might have to do a search for prescription um, drop off or pres prescription take back, a phrase like that. They actually have a mailer. They'll send you the mailer. You put your items in the mailer and mail it back to them. And that might be your best bet. Um, so that, but I would definitely, I'm glad you've been saving them in a bag because I think they're, you might want to handle it that way. All right. The next question we have is what percentage of plastics are recycled? Um, well, right now at the last count in Vermont, and we do have uh, waste composition studies every five years in the state, and it's, it's pretty comprehensive. There's actually a company that goes to transfer stations and other places where recyclables are collected and trash, and they'll, what they'll do is they'll take samples. They literally spread them out and go through every single item and count it, and then they um, you know, com compile all of the information from all around the state. And so we're consistently, our recycling rate in Vermont has been around, um, I don't want to misspeak, but my memory, I haven't checked this recently, but my memory is around 34%. It's not very high. Um, as, well, I take that back. It's higher than a lot of the nation. It's not as high as our goals are in Vermont. And one of the one of the things we think has happened since recycling became mandatory in 2015 is that more, you know, that we've, we've also seen trash increase, unfortunately. And so we think maybe more stuff is getting recycled, but simultaneously we have more trash. Um, but nonetheless, at this point, we're around 34%. When Act 40, 148, the, the um, legislation that, um, you know, it requires the mandated recyclables, when that was passed in 2012, the goal was to get the state up to a 60% recycling rate. All right. The last question that we have is um, just asking again, um, what do we do with the um, cardboard boxes that are lo larger than two feet by two feet when flattened? I didn't hear oh, the answer to that. Okay. Question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for asking again. I'm sorry that we missed that earlier. Um, that's a really good question. And actually that is an exception to the two by two rule. You can flatten cardboard boxes and um, just, you know, even if they're bigger than two feet by, often the two feet by two feet means on two sides. So if it's, well, I guess it would still be bigger than two by two. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, we should have been more clear about that. And actually your question makes me think we need to update that slide in the presentation to be clear that cardboard actually can be much bigger than two feet by two feet. So keep recycling your cardboard the way you always have. And apologies for not being more clear about that. All right, that's all the questions we have so far. Okay. Any more questions? Um, well, I'm not seeing any more questions. Maybe one will come in while we close out. But um, just a reminder: check your email in a day tomorrow. I think, um, or pretty soon afterwards, we'll send you an email. We'll have links to some of the resources we talked about. You'll get a recording of the webinar, and you know, feel free to share it if you want to share it. it it'll go up on our YouTube page as well, and. Um, 
We also have a short survey we're going to ask you to fill out it's literally like three questions, but it helps us just refine and do better every time we present. So if you have the time to just click on that link and take it, it's literally less than a minute. We would very much appreciate it. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions. So I think we're done. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Session.